It's a pleasure to be here to welcome Margaret Hoover uh, to the Reagan Library because in some respects, we, uh, Margaret and the Reagan Foundation, have some of the same goals in mind. And that statement, probably even to Margaret, um, deserves an explanation. But before I get to the explanation, um, allow me to dispense with a few of the particular biographical details on Margaret that follow her everywhere and are essential to understanding who she is and what she is in the middle of accomplishing in her vibrant life. So some facts important for you to know. She is, of course, the great granddaughter of Herbert Hoover, the 31st President of the United States. She has worked on two presidential campaigns, one White House with President Bush, 43, and on Capitol Hill. She appears weekly, as I bet everyone in this audience knows, as a political commentator on Fox News. She is known as a cultural warrior. On Bill O'Reilly's The Factor, one of the top-rated cable TV shows in history. In addition to being on the board of overseers for the Hoover Institution at Stanford, she's also on the board of the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library Association. Finally, she is here today with her husband, John Avlon, uh, of Newsweek and the Daily Beast, among others, including CNN, as well as her parents, Andrew and Jeannie Hoover. And Andrew, of course, is uh, Herbert Hoover's grandson. I'd like to welcome you all here today. Okay, among her many goals in life, I am sure, two are key at present. Both, as I noted before, align quite well with the kinds of things that we care about here at the Reagan Foundation. The first involves something I'll call brand relevance. If you are a follower of the Reagan Foundation Library, our mission and what we stand for, you can't help but have noticed in these past couple of years that we have bent over backwards to burnish the image and the legacy of Ronald Reagan, the Reagan brand, into the minds of Americans. We've taken the opportunity of this centennial to reach many millions of Americans and remind them not just what Ronald Reagan was as a man, but more importantly, what it is he stood for. So I'm here to report the Reagan brand's in great shape. The most recent Gallup surveys reveal that Ronald Reagan's the most admired president among all Americans. Now, Margaret, too, is on a mission. She faces a different but a related brand challenge. She has set a course to build, and then where it needs it, repair the brand of the Republican Party itself. While I will let Margaret tell you why and how she believes this is possible, suffice it to say that she brings to the table ideas and through her name and through her reach, the ability to attract many newcomers to the Republican brand like few that have come before her. Now the second comparison before I introduce her I'd like to make between the mission of the Reagan Foundation and I shall call it the mission of Margaret is to attract young people to our respective causes like never before. Here at the Reagan Foundation, we have an overwhelming interest in attracting young people, particularly those who were either not even alive when President Reagan was president, or certainly old enough to vote for him, to an understanding of who he was and why his ideas were important. Without this knowledge, there is little chance that they will strive to emulate him. We've taken special care during the centennial to bring youth into all that we've done, from planning to organizing and involving. Margaret's similar task, one that rings forth in her book, involves the single-minded focus of engaging youth, the millennial generation, as she'll tell you, 50 million strong, into the hopefully welcome arms of the Republican Party. She knows that without them, there is no future for the Republican Party, and she urges us all to do something about it. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Margaret Hoover. That was wonderful, thank you. An incredible honor to be here today at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library Foundation and um, 
Foundation. Ours is the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library Association, so I conflate. Um, thank you, John, for the very generous introduction. The subtitle of my book is How a New Generation of Conservatives Can Save the Republican Party. Now, some of you may wonder if this is a bit alarmist. From what, after all, would the Republican Party need to be saved? The Republicans, after all, in 2010 had a historic election, came to Washington, and in a very short period of time have managed to change the course of the policies, especially the fiscal policies in Washington. So in the context of our recent successes, some, maybe even my father, might wonder if I'm not being a bit alarmist in my uh, subtitle. And what I would say is, this is not at all alarmist. There is a real sense of urgency and purpose behind this that John touched on. And my book is intended to be a real warning, because the Republican Party is at risk of losing an entire generation of Americans to democratic and independent voter rolls for the rest of their lives. These 30 and unders, which I call the millennials, other, others have called them Generation We, Generation Y, they're all the same. They're 30 and unders. They were born at the beginning of the Reagan era through the end of the Clinton presidency. They are the largest generation in America. In 2008, there were 50 million that were eligible to vote. Conservative estimates now have them at 80 million. They were, there are 17 million more millennials than there are baby boomers. 27 million more millennials than there are Generation X. And we all know they're not Republicans. They are overwhelmingly not Republicans. They represented 18% of the vote in 2008. They are anticipated to be as much of a quarter of the election, a quarter of the electorate in 2012. And they voted in 2010, or in, 20, in 2008, overwhelmingly for Barack Obama, two to one, 66% voted for Barack Obama, 32% for John McCain. Now, the reason this is urgent is because partisan identity takes on the characteristics of cement over time. It starts soft, and after they clear certain barriers, it begins to solidify. So after three presidential election cycles, their partisan identity basically solidifies. They voted for John Kerry in 2004. They voted for Barack Obama in 2008. This means that Republicans have roughly 16 months to make inroads into this generation before we lose them for the rest of their lives. Now, this is troubling to me. Not just because I'm a Republican, but because I believe that the ideas that the conservative movement and the ideas of the Republican Party actually have offered better solutions to the the issues that are most important to this generation and the issues that affect them most directly. Now the title of my book, not the subtitle, the title American Individualism is a reference to my great grandfather Herbert Hoover and a guiding principle that he set forth almost 90 years ago and which I believe captures the spirit of the millennial generation in surprising ways. And I'm going to go into this in a minute, but I want to tell you a little bit about my own background first, besides just the headliner biography that I'm the great-granddaughter of Herbert Hoover. I, because of this, of course, have always been a proud Republican. But I've also had my own journey. Uh, since the beginning of, as far as I can remember, I've been a student of Herbert Hoover, of his life, of his legacy, but also of the American conservative movement. I never knew my great-grandfather. He passed away 13 years before I was born. But my upbringing was informed by stories of him, his wit, his wisdom, his philosophy of government. And it was also peppered with visits to the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library, which is in West Branch, Iowa, which was where he was born, but also to the Hoover Institution at Stanford University in Northern California, which he calls his proudest legacy. I also you know, grew up with some of these stories that are common in presidential families really only two generations down. So my dad has 
these fabulous stories about how he learned to make a flank with